So today uh, I'm going to talk to you about my favorite subject, uh, CAH, which is an abbreviation for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, and uh, it has to do with cortisol deficiency and increased androgen synthesis. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the results uh, that we have from our research. So the adrenal glands here in this picture, they're shining on top of, of each uh, kidney there. That's where the cortisol synthesis takes place. That's the steroid synthesis. We all start with cholesterol, and then there is a number of enzymatic steps to take us to um, aldosterone and a cortisol and also androgen synthesis. At the end, it will result in, in testosterone and DHT synthesis. Uh, and the most common deficiency that you can have in the steroid hormone synthesis is 21-hydroxylase 20 deficiency. Then you, you get a block here, and that leads to deficiency of aldosterone, which is the salt-saving uh, 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 hormone, and also um, uh, in cortisol, which is the stress hormone of the body. And uh, at the same time, you get an increase in the androgen synthesis because the cortisol deficiency drives the ACTH. So you get an increase of all the previous metabolites uh, before the block. And the one that we're using as a, a marker for, for 21-hydroxylase is 17 OHP. And that's also what we measure when we screen for this disease. The gene for 21-hydroxylase is called CYP21A2, and it's located on uh, chromosome 6, very near to the HLA class uh, uh, genes. And it has a pseudogene uh, in tandem. This means that they're sitting right next to each other like this. The CYP21P is the pseudogene, and the CYP21 is the active gene. And this is interesting because uh, in the meiosis and mitosis, there may be a crossing over um, events that will result in the active gene picking up parts and bits from the pseudogene. And, and this makes it interesting for us because then it is a limited number of mutations that cause more than 90% uh, of uh, uh, the mutations that we see in the patients. And this enables us to make genotype-phenotype correlations. So there is actually 10-point mutations and deletions that build up more than 95% of all the mutations that we have. So this makes it possible then to do this uh, 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 correlation between the clinical symptoms and the severity of the, of the gene mutation. So if you have two null mutations with completely uh, abolished enzyme activity, then you end up in the most severe form on the left-hand side here, uh, with the salt-wasting form, uh, and um, where the newborn child won't survive more than uh, two or three weeks without uh, treatment. And then uh, the I2 splice mutation, if you have the I2 splice, either as a homozygote or heterozygous with a more severe form, then you have like 1% of enzyme activity left and can survive a little bit longer. These mutations, they result in something that is classically called as simple virilizing uh, CAH, where the risk of developing salt crisis is, is much less because you still have a little bit of aldosterone synthesis. And the least... Um, severe form, the non-classic mutations typically don't uh, present with symptoms until after five years of age. This is uh, uh, not always the case. It can present earlier and it can also uh, present a lot later. So the severity is, is depending on both the salt, salt wasting but also how much virilization a 46XX fetus gets before birth. So the non-classic form, there's no prenatal virilization, and with the salt wasting and simple virilizing, we can grade the, the degree of, of uh, prenatal virilization of the external genitalia with something that is called the Prader score. If the child is not detected in the screening and not uh, diagnosed in the, in the newborn period, then they will present with 
uh, if they have the non-classic form, of course, then present with, with androgen excess symptoms such as growth, acceleration, or something that we call pseudopubertus precox with hyperandrogenism. So this is the genotype-phenotype correlation. The, the more to the left you or you're here in this, in this diagram, the least the cortisol and the more the androgens. Uh, and, and then it goes that way. And uh, the first uh, time a patient was actually treated with CH was in 1950. And I think it, it was actually that hydrocortisone was a fairly newly discovered drug and it was tested on almost everything. Uh, so then they tested this on a virilized woman uh, and, uh, and she actually normalized her androgens. So what we do is we treat with glucocorticoid f uh, in children. We use hydrocortisones, which uh, takes down the ACTH drive and then uh, the drive on the adrenals to produce all these metabolites goes down and we normalize the androgen levels. We also need to uh, introduce a mineralocorticoid uh, as a replacement of the aldosterone. And in small children, for some reason that is not known, we also need to give a little bit of extra salt. And so uh, this is interesting, since 1950, the patients uh, have had a possibility sur to survive. Of course, not all patients have survived. Uh, in Sweden, we have had screening since 1986. And we also had uh, a very fortunate situation with Anna Vedell here at Karolinska, who uh, um, uh, put a lot of time and effort into to characterizing these uh, mutations. So we have a situation with screening and where most of the patients in the Swedish population uh, with CH actually have also the genotype known. So what we've done is that we have virtually vacuum cleaned all of Sweden for the patients that we could find, uh, that we can find through the screening, that we can find through follow-up, and that we can find through the, the genotyping. And so uh, we ended up with a little more than 600 patients. Uh, and uh, then we cross-checked this against the diagnosis registry in Sweden, and we found another 30. So this was pretty complete. And it is interesting to look at what happened over time with these patients. See, here is 1910, 1920, so it's for each decade here. You can see the, the red bars are the women, and the blue bars are, are the men. You can see the oldest woman that we have here is, is, uh, was 88 years old when she was diagnosed with a mild form. So then she had children, he had, she had, had no problems. But then here you have, uh, here's a man, here is, uh, is two men or three and three or four men here. And then the first women are coming here uh, just before 1950s. And so there's more women coming up. And here, when we reach the uh, time when we have the screening after 2000, for example, there is the same number of, of men and women, which it should be since this is an autosomal recessive disease. Here is a, a little fewer because this was done in uh, 2012, 2013, so we don't have a whole decade here. But it's interesting also to note that there's more women. Also after 1980, there's more women. And, and so we can wonder, why is this? Is it uh, because we miss the men, that they die before diagnosis? No. When we look at the genotype, we can see, here you have different colors for the, for the genotype, we can see that there is some genotypes that increase here in the 80s and 90s, and that's the non-classic ones. So the non-classic women are actually not di uh, diagnosed through the screening, but they're diagnosed uh, through the, through the, the uh, clinic when they develop more antigen signs. And men, they don't go, <laughs> they don't seek medical attention for, uh, for hyperandrogenism to the same extent as, as women do. And here we can, we can uh, break, break it down into even more uh, exact information about the, the genotyping. So then we thought, well, what can we do with this? It's interesting, we can see that in the 1950s when hydrocortisone became, it became known that this can treat the disease, people started to survive. In the 60s, it was even better. And here's 1970s. That's actually when um, Martin Ritzian, who was a, um, a professor in pediatric endocrinology, he returned to Sweden after uh, a few years in, in the US. And I think just because he was aware of disease, 
then more, more uh, children were diagnosed and more, more patients survived. But we wanted to see what happens with the mortality with this disease over time. What, what, uh, and, and so we looked uh, in, in uh, the big registries that we have, um, the death registry and the cause of death registry. And we can see that the mortality for patients with CAH is of course increased compared to the background. And that could be expected, but it could also be that we would think since we diagnose most of them in the newborn period, we would be able to, to treat them and they would survive. But when we looked at the cause of death, we, were, uh, we can see here that the hazard ratio for cause of death is above three, uh, both for the males, and, but even more so for the females. And that's probably because the females were more often diagnosed since they had the virilized external genitalia to be identified in the, in the newborn period. But if we, if we take away the deaths that occurred before one year of age, that is, the ones that occurred before the screening was started, when, when children died because they were not identified in time. It's still uh, 2.6 and 3.0. 3 and when we look at the, the reason for this, it's in, in almost half of the cases, it's still an adrenal crisis. And I think this is very important information in a, in a country with, as we think, a fairly good healthcare system we still lose some of the patients because of this. So thi and, and it's also very interesting internationally. People very often think that adult uh, patients with CAH, they don't die from a genital crisis. But we could actually show that this is the case. And it's very important then to educate the patients so that they know that this is actually a risk and they need to take precautions. And we also looked at the cardiovascular morbidity, which is of course important because these patients are treated with cortisol, hydrocortisone, and prednisolone, and in some cases even dexamethasone. So they have an over exposure to, to uh, uh, glucocorticoids, which then of course could uh, uh, cause the cardiovascular disease. And this is what we see. It's, it's very much increased. And this is sort of new information because the oldest patients are just reaching their 60s now. So we haven't really known what's going to happen in the long run with these patients. And you can see also obesity is, is very much increased. And that is to almost 100% caused by overtreatment with hydrocortisone. So this is also a very important information. And what else can we learn uh, from, from CAH? We can learn things about cortisol deficiency, aldosterone uh, deficiency, cortisol overtreatment, but we can also learn about the androgen excess that these individuals have been exposed to prenatally. And so this is, uh, you can say, like an experiment of nature when we can have a look and see what happens with individuals with 46XX uh, chromosomes, um, that are exposed to different levels of androgens and have different levels of external genit virilization of external genitalia. And um, so we, uh, people have been uh, speculating and wondering what's happening uh, in the long run with this. Can we learn something about what's different between men and women, be between uh, boys and girls? And the most obvious difference between boys and girls in society is that they uh, play with uh, different toys. Mm -hmm. And so um, Sherry Berenbaum, who's a, a psychologist in the US, she set up this system that she calls toy play. And it's a very strict uh, system with girls' toys. It's very um, easy to, to recognize that these are girls' toys and boys' toys. Lincoln Logs is a special kind of tool where you um, build log cabins and that distinguishes between boys and girls. You cannot use Lego because boys and girls le play the same with, with Lego. And then neutral cards. Uh, neutral toys are very boring toys, of course. And so uh, some of you <laughs> that heard me this morning have seen this before. The neutral toys, uh, there was not much difference between boys and girls and not much difference between CAH and non-CAH. And for the girls' toys, we can see that the boys uh, even if they were controls or CAH boys, they didn't play with the girls' toys. But uh, when we look at the girls, we can see that the 
the, the control girls played with the girls' toys, and the CH girls played much less with the girls' toys. But the important thing here is that the gr control girls, they play as much with the girls' toys as they do with the boys' toys. The CH girls play a little more with the boys' toys, and the boys, regardless of if they're control boys or CH boys, they play with the boys' toys. So uh, we can actually conclude that girls' toys are toys that boys don't play with. And there's no such thing as boys' toys. So this is what it looks like. Uh, you have a semicircle like this, you have the toy set up, and then uh, you put the child in the middle, and you say, um, please play, and, and the children actually do that. And then uh, you can go back on the videotape and measure the number of seconds that you're in contact with these different uh, toys. And so what do we see? Yeah, we have the genotype-phenotype correlation here. We have the, the null I2 splice, I so like this in these different groups, the same as I explained before. I, and I also should say that um, we were interested to see what would happen in a society like Sweden that possibly was a m little bit more emancipated than, than the United States. And also we had the genotype. So we wanted to see if this was a dose effect or if there was a, a threshold effect. Uh, and so we traveled around in Sweden, took all the children that we could find, all the girls. There were thir 31 girls and 31 controls the same age, plus minus one, one month. And then we could see that the number of seconds that the null genotype group played with the boys' toys was more than the, the less severe forms. And this was actually uh, significant. When we look at what they, they do with the, with the girls' toys, well, there is not, not, no significance. And with the neutral toys, uh, the milder forms play more with the neutral toys. So then the psychologists that we were working with when we were doing this, they said, well, uh, um, this is all to do with the expectations that the parents have of their children. They know that they have been masculinized, so they expect them to play more with boys' toys. So then we did that they played both alone, and then did some other things, and then played with the parent. And, and so we take toy play alone minus toy play with the parent present. So you can see everything that is positive is what they do when they play alone. Everything that is on the negative side is what they do more when they have the parent. So they're actually playing more with the boys' toys when they're alone and, and less when they're with the, with the parent. So this does not come out significant, but the question is, do the parents make them play more with the boys' toys? And for that question, we can say no. So um, the toy to keep, we gave a present, of course, when we left, and it's the same kind of picture that there's more boys' toys, a car or a ball, on this side, and then the first doll uh, you can see here for the simple virilizing form, and then for the mild form, and and the in the control girls there was only two girls uh, choosing a, a car. So then we think that we can say that girls with CH played more with masculine toys than the control girls, uh, and uh, that the severity of the disease uh, correlates with the degree of masculinization of behavior. So there has to be some kind of dose-response relationship. It doesn't have to be linear, of course, but the, it does, it's not the threshold effect. And it supports a biological basis for these differences in behavior. We also asked things like draw a person. It was the same thing here. The severe form was more often uh, they were drawing uh, a boy. Uh, and um, for, for we also went on to look at uh, adult women with CAH. Um, uh, there were 62 women, uh, and um, they were also distributed in the different uh, genotype groups. And we uh, asked, or we looked into how what they were working with, what kind of occupation. We said if they had male dom dominant occupation, that is an occupation with less than 25% women, it, it's these blue bars here, and these, uh, there was at least two of the, these are only five uh, that, that were um, civil engineers, which is becoming more and more of a, a female. But it ha may have to do with uh, three-dimensional spatial uh, orientation. 
And then the extreme male dominant occupation with less than 12% women, it's also like this. The more severe, more, more common, and less here, and then nothing here. Uh, and we also asked what um, uh, interests they had in the free time, and they uh, mentioned motor interest, and that was also this uh, kind of, of uh, uh, falling uh, numbers as you go towards the milder forms. With sexual orientation, we asked, uh, but this is, is not a very good way of asking the question, of course, but we asked, are you uh, bi or homosexual? Uh, and uh, not everyone uh, knew how to answer this question, but those who did, they, that was the same situation. In the Newell group, half of the women said that they were actu either bi or homosexual. There was uh, a little more than 20% in this group and only a few here, uh, but still more than the controls. Uh, what's more annoying or, or worrying, I think, is that uh, they were more often also uh, living alone. Was a spare time in there. So then we wanted to go into this, uh, looking into the big registries again. We were thinking, can we find out how are they doing? What's their quality of life, and and how is the situation for them? Uh, and so we did took these proxies for quality of life, education, if they uh, what kind of level of education they reached, the work they had, the if they were working or if they were uh, were on sick leave. Uh, what kind of income, and if they were married, and if they had children. And uh, we saw some differences in the results between men and women here. Uh, and, and one thing that we were a bit surprised to find was that uh, it was, uh, when we looked at how many of these had finished ninth grade with, with, full, uh, with all the different subjects, uh, we saw that uh, it was the odds ratio was 0 0.5 for the whole group, but it was much more difficult, uh, a lot uh, more common that the, the women had not finished ninth grade with full complete grades. But the men, there was no difference between, between the CH and the normal population. We had 100 controls per CAH uh, patient. So uh, it was especially the salt wasting women that were less likely to finish ninth grade. Uh, and um, but the men, it was still okay. Uh, so you could say, well, it could be hypoglycemia, it could be salt wasting crisis, but then it would be the same for both the men and the women. So the most likely explanation is is probably that it's the psychosocial effects of having the androgen exposure prenatally uh, that uh, uh, makes it difficult when you reach teenage years. But then we also uh, uh, looked at at uh, the academic, the level of academic education that you could reach, and then we could see that uh, uh, the patients in the salt wasting form, they uh, were more likely to reach an academic position or academic level of education. And interestingly, the salt wasting women, they were more likely to reach the top 20% of an income compared uh, to, the, to the income level of those years uh, over time. And this is, I think, possibly, we haven't looked into that yet, but it could be that they more often choose a male dominant occupation that is more well paid. And, but they're more often on sick leave, which uh, could be uh, expected, of course. We also looked at the psychiatric diagnosis, which uh, we thought was uh, an important part of, of knowing how, how are they doing over time. And we found that it was the odds ratio of, of getting a psychiatric diagnosis of a lifetime was 1.5 um, increased uh, uh, compared to, to the normal population and 1.9 for the women. I'm sorry, there is an extra M there. The suicide uh, was inclusive, including attempts of suicide was more common in the men, although there's only a few, so it, 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 sh it should be interpreted with caution. Stress-related diagnosis uh, was more, uh, more common, uh, and alcohol misuse uh, was more common in both groups. And then alcohol misuse in this context could be that they're in seeing a doctor more often, and maybe that is, is diagnosed more mm -hmm. often, but it, al it could also be sort of self-medication if you're more uh, 
prone to develop anxiety and stress-related uh, uh, symptoms. So, so what we're seeing here is, is we're looking at, at what does the androgen do and what does the, the um, deficiency of cortisol do. So we're actually uh, looking at the cortisol deficiency and cortisol excess. We have looked a little bit of that. And we're looking at the androgen excess prenatally. What effects uh, does that have in the long term? And we can look a lot more, of course, to see if it affects uh, the, the vulnerability to, for example, cardiovascular disease. It may not only be what we're doing um, in later in life. Uh, and also, if there's an androgen excess uh, later in life affecting, of course, then fertility. Uh, and the psychological effects must be uh, addressed uh, in the future. So, um, there's a lot to do to improve the care for these patients uh, and to learn. Uh, and this can they can also teach us about some of the basic effects uh, of these hormones. Okay, thank you. And I also want to say thank you to a lot of the people that I have worked with over the years uh, as, as we have been doing this uh, project. <laughs>